welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another seasonal classics recommendations video summer edition and it's actually kind of late for me to be doing this video it is now late june and i feel like usually i put them up before the season starts but the weather in my location has not been feeling very summer like and so i think i simply forgot that it was summer and so we're filming this now, we're putting this out now. I do have one from last year that I will link down below and an entire playlist of seasonal classics recommendations, but this is going to be the 2023 version. And I'm just going to get right into it with my first recommendation. And that is Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare, which is my favorite Shakespeare play. I will never miss an opportunity to recommend this Shakespeare play because it's my favorite and I think it's great, but I think it is especially suited for summer, which I will get into. Julius Caesar is a tragedy and it follows the assassination of Julius Caesar. So it follows the conspiracy that leads up to the assassination and then the aftermath of sort of the vacuum in power that is created because of his assassination. And our tragic hero in this play is Brutus, who is a close friend of Caesar and he becomes a conspirator and he is our tragic hero of the story. And I mainly think that this one is suited for summer. I think it's suited for year round because again it's my favorite the speeches in this play are just incredible but Julius Caesar more than other Shakespeare plays I think feels very alive and visceral and like the environment is just so vivid in a way that I don't think is as present in other Shakespeare plays I think the histories always feel very real in Shakespeare. And this is not technically history, it's a tragedy, but it does deal with historical events and historical figures. And I think the historical types of plays that deal with Roman figures specifically are really interesting for Shakespeare because he's able to deal with a lot of political commentary that he wouldn't necessarily be able to hit on when he's talking about the current crown in Britain that he was writing under. There's a lot of really good political commentary. Again, the environment just feels alive in a way that I think some other Shakespeare's don't. The speeches are my favorite. And the characters are my favorite. I would just highly recommend this. It feels right for summer. And I think a big theme for the entirety of this video is just going to be like atmospheres that feel very alive. Like as I'm reading Julius Caesar, I feel like I am on the streets of Rome with the peasant uprisings and with everything that's going on, I feel like I'm there and that's the kind of book that I want in the summer. I want everything to be very vivid. So that's the theme of this and it's going to continue with my next recommendation which is The Odyssey by Homer. I think last year I recommended The Iliad, now we're going to go with The Odyssey. And The Odyssey follows Odysseus's journey to get back home after the Trojan War. So he has been fighting in the Trojan War for I forgot how many years, but a lot of years, that's what's recounted in the Iliad. And then the Odyssey is post-Trojan War, Odysseus just trying to get home, and him really not succeeding at doing that because he meets so many scrapes and challenges along the way, so many mythological creatures and just things that he has to deal with. And of course, because he is Odysseus, he is clever, he is favored by Athena and Zeus and all the gods, he gets his way out of all of them, but but it's pretty much him just, the man just trying to get home to Penelope. That's what the Odyssey follows. And I think it's suited for summer in a similar way that I said Julius Caesar was suited for summer because I think Homer feels very alive. And I, I talked about this for quite some time in my most recent video, which is a reading vlog of me reading the Iliad and retellings, just talking about how Homer like sounds like a song and when you read the verse it has a certain rhythm to it that is just very pleasing and makes the atmosphere feel very alive and just evokes a certain like set of emotions that I don't think you get from other epic verse or not even epic verse but just verse in general. I think it's a unique kind of verse and especially in the way that the immortal gods are talked about and all of these very grand figures are talked about. Everything feels very large and important and otherworldly in Homer in a way that it doesn't if I can't think of anything to compare it to but just it feels very grand. I think in part by nature of the subject material because again it's talking about the Greek gods but then another part of it I think is just the rhythm of the verse. This is a work that has gotten down to us because of oral tradition and so it was spoken aloud and it would be performed in ancient Greece and so I think the rhythm of it being that type of work 
has stayed there even though we're reading it today on paper and so I think it's a perfect one for summer. The few sunny days that we've had here I've taken the Iliad and I've sat outside with it and it just feels like the right choice for summer. So the Odyssey is my choice for this summer. My next recommendation is going to be Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. This one follows, again, I have a whole video on this that I will link down below because it is one of my favorite works now, without a doubt. But Lolita follows a middle-aged man, Humbert Humbert, who becomes obsessed with this child. I believe at the beginning of Lolita, she might be 10 or 12, I don't know, but he becomes obsessed with this child and he is a pedophile before Lolita and then when he meets Lolita, he's been a pedophile for his entire life. And it's very disturbing because what Lolita is, is it's written as a first-hand account by Humbert Humbert. He's writing it like a testimony, and so it really is delving into his mind, and it is the mind of a pedophile. And so it is very disturbing to read, but it is the best example of unreliable narration that I have ever read in my entire life, and I have a hard time believing that anything can top it. I think it is a masterpiece of literature and I would highly recommend it, again, for any time of year. But I think in summer, I personally read it last summer, and I think this part to me mainly is because a big chunk of the novel is Humbert taking Lolita, I guess, on a road trip. That seems like the wrong word though, because it's like a sick twisted series of events that's happening. I wouldn't really call it like a road trip, but they're going through America and a big part of it is him describing American landscapes. And so I remember reading those landscapes in the summer felt appropriate. I also find like landscape scenes kind of boring usually, but I think reading this outside in the sun and like reading these descriptions of landscapes was a good combination. And so that is why I would recommend it as a summer read. And fun fact, Vladimir Nabokov never wanted any pictures of young girls to be on the cover of Lolita. He wanted a picture of an American landscape, so he clearly thought it was important. Him not wanting young girls on the cover is a story for another day that I get into in my Lolita video, which again I will link down below, but I'm not going to get into that here. Overall, I would just recommend Lolita. Next one is a very long, long book, so if you want a book to last you the entire summer. Actually, depending on how into it you are, you might go through it faster, but it is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. This one follows the revenge of Edmond Dantes, and boy oh boy, what an epic revenge story it is. It basically follows him getting revenge on those who wronged him. He is imprisoned for quite a long time, quite a very many of years. He is imprisoned, and it is because he was wronged by certain individuals, and so when he gets out of prison, The Count of Monte Cristo, the bulk of it follows his revenge story. And it is incredibly long, but the way I kind of see The Count of Monte Cristo, and this could be because of the way that I was introduced to this book, but it seems to me just like a mega, like, I, I don't know if soap opera is the word, but just like a very long TV series where you are just on the edge of your seat waiting for the next episode because it feels very episodic but then at the same time it's so exciting to read what is happening next. That's always the way I think about it but again it could be just me because I personally read The Count of Monte Cristo because I was watching a Spanish soap opera in which the main character's favorite book was The Count of Monte Cristo and her like life kind of mirrored the events of The Count of Monte Cristo. Not exactly, but her story was one of revenge and so is Edmund's story. And so that's kind of why it kind of reads to me like a soap opera, I think. But regardless, it's a great book. It's really long, but it's actually very action-packed and exciting. It's not going to be like a super boring, really long book. I was going to say like Les Miserables, but that seems like the ultimate betrayal. Did those words just leave my mouth? But I think we've established that Les Miserables is not the most gripping of tales at all times, let's be honest. The sewer pages, I love them, but I understand that they're kind of a lot. So if you want something more action-packed for the summer, the Count of Monte Cristo. My next pick is A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Not my favorite Dickens by any sense of the word, I don't think, but A Tale of Two Cities follows 
two cities, Paris and London, during the French Revolution. And it follows a couple of different characters. Dickens' novels are usually kind of hard to give like a bare bones plot summary because it follows quite a very many characters. This cast is a little smaller actually than some of Dickens' other casts. One of the main characters that it follows is Lucy Minette and when we open, her father is being released from a long imprisonment in Paris. Then again, it kind of follows a larger cast and it flips back and forth between Paris and London. Again, this is not my favorite Dickens, but not there's only one Dickens that can be my favorite Dickens, so that's not, that's not too big of a mark against it, I don't think. But I do think this one I, is unique amongst Dickens novels. Part of it is the fact that it's focusing on these two cities and, and flipping back and forth, but I think another part, the famous opening of A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it feels like in this novel particularly, Dickens is taking like a snapshot of a very particular time in history, shining a magnifying glass on these characters that are living through the French Revolution. I'm having a hard time explaining what I think this book is and why I think this book is suited for summer, but I think it's just because summer is a fleeting time and usually things are more vivid in the summer. There's often a lot of change in the summer, there's a lot of things that last only in the summer, and that's kind of, for all of these, it's kind of like the vibe it gives me, but for A Tale of Two Cities specifically, I think it gives me that vividness and that fleetingness more than other Dickens books give me. I think part of it is the infusion of history and part of it is the particular events that happen in this book. I don't want to give away what happens in the end, but I think a combination of the events, just the language that's used, even that like opening passage that we get in A Tale of Two Cities, the characters and just what Dickens is dealing with in this book, I think it's unique amongst his novels and I think that that's why I know at least in the US this is kind of the one that gets assigned a lot that may be why but I don't know maybe none of that made sense and I really am I've joked before that I am becoming like your wacky English teacher maybe that was the most wacky English teacher I've ever given me just vaguely saying how it's more vivid and a snapshot I don't know but if you understood where I'm going with it, great. If not, it's a great novel regardless. I would recommend that you read it regardless of whether any of that made sense. And Dickens is always just great. The next one that I'm going to recommend is Lord of the Flies by William Golding. This one, I mean, it's kind of for obvious reasons maybe why it's on this list. This one follows a plane that crashes on this deserted island. And I forget if the only people that were on the plane were children or if the children were the only survivors, but basically it ends up being just children in the aftermath of this plane crash and they are left to survive and form any semblance of a society and just fend for themselves and i'm putting it on this list because the setting is an island and it's kind of a cheap shot but also it took me quite a while to read the lord of the flies i had never been assigned it even though i went through the entirety of the u.s public school system never got it assigned never read it in my youth and so I figured I should just read it, though I wasn't sure how much I would like it. But I ended up thinking that it was so incredibly interesting. I think, and I like get why it's an assigned pick now, I think the way that William Golding is using this event to kind of, I guess, just question like what does constitute a working society and like why do human beings act the way they do and the difference between human nature and just external imposed rules, if that makes sense. It was so incredibly interesting to just read about these boys trying to start from scratch and then to kind of watch it all fall apart. And I think it really, well, it made me think at least, like what actually keeps human beings in check? Is it nature? Is it external rules? Is it governments? All of these interesting questions came up as I was reading. I thought it was explored in a really, really interesting way because I knew that that's kind of what it was going to explore. Like I knew, I fully knew the ending of The Lord of the Flies before I had started. I knew the plot. I knew it would be like, okay, they're trying to like play adults or whatever it was. But the way that it was explored was actually, I think, incredibly well done. And so I would highly recommend this. It's a short read. And again, it's a cheap shot because it's set on an island and I'm putting it on a summer list, but 
I'm gonna take the cheap shot. Read the Lord of the Flies. The next one on this list is Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo. This one follows, I literally forgot the guy's name, but it follows the son of Pedro Paramo on his mom's deathbed. He makes the promise that he will find his father and he will reconnect with his father. And so it follows him trying to find his father. And it is a modernist text, which means the plot it goes in so many different directions from there. It moves back and forth in time and space and between the living and the dead. And it tackles so much, I think, in the very short amount of pages that it has. I think it's less than 200 pages, maybe less than 150. I think the writing was just so good. And I can't even tell you every single thing that happened because I usually can't sit here and say every single thing that happened in a modernist text just because the plot is not really the point I would say but the writing was so good the characters even though like we met so many and some of their time on the page was really brief they were really well done I just thoroughly enjoyed my time with Pedro Paramo I thought it explored a lot of interesting themes within it of intergenerational ties and again life and death it was just a really good modernist text and I would highly recommend it again I think it's suited for the summer just because I think by nature, modernist texts are always sort of more vivid, and this one was no different. And then I think the the setting, again, was really well done. So kind of for similar reasons that I recommended all the other ones on this list, this one is really good. I really liked it, and I want to actually reread it because I think it would lend itself really well to rereading. The next one is another maybe cheap shot. I don't know, but it's Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Am I putting it on the summer list because I'm like, travels, maybe, but... I would recommend it regardless and it's going to be on this list regardless. So Gulliver's Travels follows Gulliver who travels, which I know I am great at this. It's broken up into four books and he travels to four different places and pretty much what it is is that Jonathan Swift is satirizing different aspects of society in these four different places. I don't exactly remember what the ridiculous names of each of these four places were. For example, in one of the worlds, I remember it was just a land full of horses in one of the books. It's teeny tiny people. In another book, I think it's giants. And Jonathan Swift, as you may know if you've read, what is that? A Modest Proposal. That's what it is. That I think is one of his most famous works. He is an excellent satirist. He is so clever and I think funny, but then also hard hitting. It's just the best blend of satire you could possibly think of. It's hilarious, but it's also hilarious in a way that makes you be like, oh my gosh, he's really saying some truths, I think. And so Gulliver's Travel, yes, it is funny and there has been movies made. I think that there's one with Jack Black because a lot of like the situations that Gulliver finds himself in are ridiculous, but then behind the ridiculousness is the hard hitting satire that I just think is the best combo because yes, I like I like funny books, but I also always like when there's stuff between the lines and Jonathan Swift is really good at that. And so I would recommend Gulliver's Travels. We're once again going to take the cheap shot. We're taking it because it's a summer read because there are travels. We're just going to go with it. Next book that is going to be on this list is Passing by Nella Larson. This one follows two friends, Claire and Irene, who reunite after, I forgot after how long, but they reunite after some time. There are two black women, but one has decided to live as a white woman, hence the title Passing. She is passing as white. That's how she's decided to live her life. It's set in 1920s New York. And this is a really interesting novel for a lot of reasons, and I would just recommend it in general, but specifically I put it on the summer list because I remember the opening scene of Passing is one that is still vividly ingrained in my mind even though I read this book like two or three years ago. And it is set at a hotel and this is where Claire and Irene reunite for the first time and I just vividly remember it being a hot day and one of the characters getting an iced drink and I just remember it being so vivid and I also remember the ending scene of Passing being so vivid and I think it's kind of rare for a book to have scenes that are that vivid that they stay with you for that long. I remember that this novel was very intense throughout and again very vivid. All of the settings and the environment were just drawn with such incredible detail that I think it's suited for the summer. But again, this is a really interesting book. For year round, I think looking at Irene and Claire's life in parallel, considering the choices that they made, 
is incredibly interesting. And it also, I believe they made an adaptation. I forgot what streaming service it's on. There is a recent adaptation of it if you read it and decide that you are interested. Can't speak for the adaptation but would highly recommend the book. And my last recommendation is not a book but it is just a poet. I've been throwing poets on here recently and my poet pick for summer is William Wordsworth. He might honestly be on another seasonal classics video, maybe like spring or something. I don't know, but William Wordsworth is a romantic poet, which means that he kind of takes ordinary scenes of life or just ordinary scenes of nature, just sort of the everyday, and writes about it as if it's the most beautiful, important thing of the world. Poets in the past, classical poets, would typically not focus on the things that romantic poets focus on. So Wordsworth, for example, will focus on a laborer coming home from his job, or a woman working out side doing something. These are great examples, but just ordinary scenes of life, ordinary people, ordinary just a field of daffodils that he saw, just everyday occurrences, everyday scenes, everyday events, and just write about it as if it's the most beautiful thing on this earth. And my favorite poem by him is the one about the daffodils, but I do like a lot of his poetry. I would recommend just dabbling in Wordsworth. I think he is perfect for the summer. I do have a collection of Wordsworth's poetry that I've been working through this summer. Maybe I'll make a video about my favorite poems that I find from that book. But I think he is perfect for summer. And it's warm outside. I think if you're spending time outside, I think reading Wordsworth just really makes you appreciate just the outdoors and just everything because he again just writes about these ordinary scenes and infuses beauty into everything that he sees and so i love reading him would highly recommend one of my favorite poets and with that being said we have reached the end of this video let me know if you have any recommendations for classics that are suited to summer or since we are already honestly well into summer what has been your favorite book that you've read so far this summer i would love to hear but for now thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next video